Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Croc School and the International Rescue Committee's annual Refugee Film Festival. I'm Andrew Blum. I'm the executive director of the Croc Institute for Peace and Justice here at the Croc School. Um, the Croc School of Peace Study is the only peace school in the world located on an international border. And every one of our programs, from our humanitarian affairs program to our conflict resolution, peace and justice, our social innovation program, wrestles with the challenges and the opportunities uh, that the border creates for our region. And that's why we're so pleased this year uh, to be able to partner with the IRC to put on uh, their annual film festival. Tonight is the third and final night of the film festival. And so as a, as a wonderful capstone uh, for the festival, we also have a distinguished lecture tonight uh, by an amazing uh, human rights activist, Gerilene Joseph, the founder and executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance. Um, I'm going to be out after the film to introduce her uh, more fully. Um, after the lecture, we'll have a Q&A. So I know it's coming up on the screen, but I want to remind you, if you want to provide questions for the Q&A, you can go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and enter the code 2764033. 2764033. As I said, I'll be back out after the film uh, to introduce Ms. Joseph. So for now, uh, to introduce the film, I want to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Clay Alexander, to introduce the film tonight. Good evening, everyone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, that was easy. Thank you. Enjoy the show. <laughs> thank you all very, uh, so very much for coming this evening, and thank you to those who I keep recognizing as this is your third week in a row with us here at this incredible theater. And just very quickly, I'd like to take the time to thank the Croc School for hosting the IRC and letting us have this gorgeous theater and this gorgeous location. After the film, I highly and um, encourage you to take a look around and see the beautiful architecture of this building. So just a quick thank you to Topher, to Farah, to Andy for having us here. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the Otto Family Foundation who has sponsored this event and has made it possible for us to have these incredible films, our incredible speakers, and to bring this experience to you. Cheche la vie is a Haitian phrase that means finding life. And it is often used to describe the immigrant experience and coming to a new place and rebuilding community. As we emerge from a pandemic, I'm sure we're all very, very familiar with this idea of finding life and finding a community. Now you can only imagine, add the stress of being in a location that you don't know, having your life changed from forces outside of your control and finding your life in a new place, in a new country where you might be alone. This film will hit close to home. Quite literally, it was filmed in San Diego. You will recognize streets, you will recognize freeways. As we watch the film, I invite you to think about how not only you can find your life, but how can you find your community and build your community so that others can rebuild and find their life as well. With that, I present to you Sheshi Levy. Each year we invite prominent individuals working on issues of peace and human rights and social justice to share their stories with, with the university community, with the San Diego uh, community. And as we were thinking about integrating uh, a distinguished lecture into the film festival and especially knowing um, the powerful film we were going to see tonight, uh, the choice of the distinguished lecture or the distinguished lecturer 
for tonight was, was obvious. Um, we are so pleased to have Gerline Joseph here with us tonight. Gerline is a leading human rights activist, thought leader, strategist who has dedicated her life to bringing issue, awareness to issues that affect us all, including immigration, domestic violence, child sexual abuse, and other human rights issues. She's founder and executive director of the Haitian Bridge Alliance, the only black-led, women-led, Haitian-American-led organization serving migrants at the U.S.-Mexico border. She was named one of Politico's 2021 40 Most Influential People on Race, Politics, and Policy in the United States, and is the recipient of the prestigious Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award. She's testified in front of the United Nations, the U.S. Congress, and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, in a moment, I will invite Ms. Joseph up. After the lecture, we'll have a Q&A uh, moderated by my colleague and the director of the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice, Rebecca Cazares. Let me introduce Rebecca briefly as well. She's the director of the Cross-Border Initiatives at our Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice. She was born and raised in Tijuana and has a background in healthcare, public health, and humanitarian action. She previously worked as research manager and clinical director at Previn Casa, a nonprofit organization that provides healthcare services and humanitarian assistance to underserved populations in Tijuana. As a reminder to submit questions for the Q&A, go to slido.com and enter code 276-4033. So it's time for me to stop talking and invite Gerline Joseph up to the stage. I have no idea who he was talking about. <laughs> you see what happens when you get Haitians together in a room. Um, when I say on respect is a way that we address people with honor and respect. Um, coming to you with a lot of gratitude, a lot of humility, and um, really looking forward to um, continuing uh, this journey. I uh, understand each of you being here today is that by accident. It's because there, um, we are in a journey, in a journey for life, as you just watched the movie, Sheshilavi, which literally means looking for life. And in this journey looking for life, we need community, we need allies. I need you, you need me, so we can continue to make this journey together. Um, again, thank you so much. My name is Gerlin Joseph with the Haitian Bridge Alliance. Also wanted to add the Black Immigrants Bell Fund and the Cameroon Advocacy Network. One thing we say is that we came to the border for the Haitians, but we realized we had people from all over the world. We came for the Haitians, and we stayed for everyone. Maybe I can um, begin by a quick, uh, um, I'm sure you all know about Haiti and the history of Haiti, but maybe I can briefly uh, share with you where I was born, where I am from, the history, the culture, the people, as we are seeing Haitian continue to migrate, understanding who they are, what language do they speak, what food do they eat, how do we receive them, how do we collaborate, how do we serve them. So Haiti is a little highland um, in the Caribbean Sea, um, but mighty 
in every possible way that you can think of. Haiti is the second country after the United States in the Americas, and we fought for independence. We fought the French army and won what I like to say, excuse my French, we kicked their derriere. <laughs> now imagine you have enslaved people taken from Africa, yet they could not be broken. They bend themselves together, they fought, they won, giving us this new world as we know it today. Without Haiti, we will not have the world that we have today. That is the reality, that is the fact. And I just want to share a quick quote from Frederick Douglass, the very first ambassador to Haiti from the United States. When he came back and he was speaking to the country, he said, and I quote, the United States will never forgive Haiti for being black. And the world will never forgive God himself for creating Haiti black. And we continue to pay for that today. And as a result, we saw people continue to come to our border, seeking for life. But unfortunately, many of those lives have been lost. The story of Robins and Gems is the story of hundreds and thousands and millions of people around the world. But what we really saw in this film is also a story of love, of friendship, of loneliness. But they found comfort in each other, in their communities, in their adopted country, Mexico. And so, for me, I like to bring people back and forth so that we can really immerse ourselves in the experience of others. And um, in my very small contribution, I really, really want to highlight the realities of immigrants but really centering the voices and lives of impacted community members. Many times we hear about migration and we hear the narratives that could be extremely negative. And many times we see voices erased, the voices of black and indigenous peoples in displacement, in migration, Shechelavi. Too many times, those voices have been erased. Intentionally, unintentionally, but that's the reality. So what do we do? We make sure we highlight and center the voices of those people. And that is why I am so grateful to Quark Institute and IRC for inviting me to share with you all today and to highlight those voices. I myself was born in Haiti. I was privileged enough to get on a plane, landed in New York, although life as I knew in Haiti was shattered, separated from my family for over 10 years. Yet, we were able to not just survive, but thrive. And in that story of mine, my quest is to also lend a hand, a voice to all people in search of a home, in search of life. When we think about the border, and I always say the border is a concept created for the least of us. Because the reality is if you have the right passport, you have the right name, you have the right money, borders don't exist for you. If you can get on your private jet, we can go to Cancun to tonight, 
decide to go get some coconut in Panama tomorrow. There's no border. But if you are fleeing for your life from Somalia, from Sudan, from Cameroon, from Haiti, from countries around the world, then we create borders to criminalize, to demonize, and frankly, to kill people. So the quest for life through migration is not only complicated, it is also complex. Today in Haiti, for example, we have active gang violence that is overtaking entire neighborhood, including the ones I was born and raised in. Two weeks ago, the gang overtook the entire neighborhood, killing anyone in sight, including three of my cousins. That's the realities people are fleeing today. And we have Daniel Tse here, amazing young man from Cameroon. He fled Cameroon only to face humiliation, imprisonment in the United States. Today, he gives back every single day to make sure those he has left in immigration prisons, those who probably didn't make it, he honors them, and together, we at the Haitian Bridge Alliance continue to serve. One of the things that um, Robbins and James mentioned is getting a number, right, to be able to get access to, um, to an appointment to come to the US. That was back in 2017, in 16, 2017. Today, we saw CBP-1 being in, 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 um, in effect. And we continue to see the impact of crucial, cruel policies such as Title 42 that has literally closed every avenue for people to have access to a safety. Um, in August of last year, I was able to make my way to the Darien Gap. That is between Colombia and Panama. That is one of the most dangerous places on earth. Yet, we have young men, pregnant women with children making the journey. Unfortunately, many of them do not survive. I was there. I saw it so I can better understand, better serve, and share with you and invite you to be a part of this journey. Our immigration system is broken, but it was created to be broken. Um, I know Paige probably going to kill me because I completely went off script <laughs> and um, going over some of the pictures that um, she wanted me to share which I am sure you have seen time and time again. Let me see if that works. Okay, so that, that one. How many of us remember the, ver the first picture? That picture was when the veil, the veil was finally opened so the world could see the reality of black people at the border. Because when we speak about migration, we tend to forget that people from around the world are there. Not just my brothers and sisters and cousins from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and so far. The second picture, has any one of you seen that coin or the picture of it? That is a picture from 
an entity that is connected to Border Patrol. And honor will always be first, dignity last, I will add to that. This is the very likeness of Mirad Joseph, who made the journey, as you can see. He's only carrying food. Food to his wife and kid that were on US soil, starving. He had to go back to Mexico to bring them food. And that is how we, as the nation, treated them. And to glorify that moment, this is the depiction that an entity that is connected to CBP chose to uplift and highlight. And that's one of many, many negative messages that have been shared around the world. But we understand that the criminalization and dehumanization of others has always been a part of the fabric of this United States of ours. You can read it yourself. No more Chinese. That's the reality. Help wanted. No Irish need to apply. I must say that is before our brothers and cousins, our Irish brothers and cousins became white in the United States. That is the reality. Um, so with all of that, how do we move as a country, as a people, to uphold human rights, to push our government to center whatever policies that they are putting in place is rooted in dignity. I'm a firm believer that we can do it. I'm a firm believer that we must stand on the right side of history. I stand before you humble. I stand before you fearless. And I stand before you because I have no other choice. As I was speaking to my amazing friend, I told her I should have taken the red pill. Anybody remember the matrix? Because on that fateful day, when I received that call in 2015, I just arrived from representing Haiti in South Korea without knowing what was happening at the border. I received a call that said, you are the Haitian I know. We have some black people at the border. They say they are Haitians. Come take care of them. I thought it was a joke. Ignored him the first time, the second time, the third time. I drove from Orange County and met with 12 young men and women. And Sir Josiane is here, Sister Josiane. And I remember meeting her around that time. 12 young men and women, I can take care of them. Get them to New York, to Miami, but I should have taken the red pill. Because 12 turned into 40, turned into 50, turned into 400, and I became a part of the community. And I chose to serve because I was called to serve. And I could clearly remember my father said, if you are not providing support, if you are not serving, what is your purpose? 
In tragedy, sometimes we find our purpose. So, this is what we will continue to do. And I am asking all of you to join us in calling on the administration to force them to address what causes of migration, to understand what people are fleeing, to make sure that when we welcome people, we welcome them with respect and dignity. We cannot continue policies of deterrence Yes, the announcements might sound fair, they might sound feasible, but the reality is people are dying. Migration is a right. Migration is a human right. Migration is a social justice issue. Migration is a racial justice issue. Migration is my issue. It's your issue. It's our issue. And I know that we can be on the right side of history. The unattainable dreams that people have, the dreams from James and Robbins, as you saw, they made the journey together. One of them got deported, one of them was forced to stay in Mexico. Too many people, too many lives have been lost. So once again, I'd like to say thank you to each and every one of you for joining. May your search for life be connected to their search for life, and may all search for lives be connected. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Colleen. And um, I'd just like to reiterate, we're so excited to have you here and so thankful. Um, I was wondering if you could start us off by talking a little bit more about uh, that journey from when you decided to take the blue pill and starting Haitian Bridge Alliance. Uh, what was that journey for you like? Painful. <laughs> Um, it's been a long journey because when I received that first call, it was in 2015. And as, as many of you might know and have heard, um, people were survivors of the earthquake that happened in Haiti. 250,000 people died in one day. Um, and many of the survivors ended up in Brazil when the economy collapsed around um, the, the, the um, World Cup and the Olympics, many people found themselves once again having to flee. And um, that's when I received the call. And as, as an immigrant myself, I couldn't even understand what they were saying. What do you mean you actually walked from Brazil to the border? And people literally walk crossing 11 borders. And so um, when I received the call, I came and I saw, and here we are. It, it's been a, a long and painful journey. I live in Orange County. I was literally coming to San Diego every single day for four years straight. And many people will laugh and will make jokes, you know, even Sir Josiane, who was the one cooking the meals for, for the folks. And um, yeah, how many years later, we are still here, not only in San Diego, but uh, the only black-led organization um, in partnership with our many, many partners on the ground, covering from Tapachula 
um, all the way to Tijuana. We have an office in Tapachula, an office in Tijuana, one in San Diego, and we have a staff and community members around the country. How did you decide it was absolutely necessary to start your own organization? Well, uh, we sat, there were five of us, and we, we, I reached out, you know, to, to different folks to see who might be, want to, to take the blue pill. <laughs> um, and um, we, we just sat down and, and, and I told, you know, we, we have to do something. Um, and that's how we started, uh, uh, honestly, and because there were, there were no home for folks coming in, in from Haiti. There were literally no home, no cultural understanding, no language access. We are grateful for the many organizations in San Diego that were helping then and continues to provide services, but the reality is there were absolutely no understanding of who those people were and who they are, what language do they speak. As I mentioned, what do they eat? How do you even understand them if, you know, you have no idea of who they are. So uh, HBA was, was born out of necessity. So you started this journey in 2015 advocating uh, for, as you said, initially Haitian migrants, and you stayed for everyone, created, uh, co-created Haitian Bridge Alliance in 2016. So you've seen three different administrations with constantly changing immigration policies, a global pandemic, um, and still the turmoil and, and all the, uh, uh, the troubles back home in Haiti still going on. So how would you characterize the evolution of Haitian Bridge Alliance through all of this? What has been gained and what have been the greatest challenges? Uh, maybe I should add Charlotte to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, maybe Josiane and, and I want to, to acknowledge our amazing team in San Diego. Some of them are here today. We have our uh, staff attorney, Charlotte. Um, I think we have Daniel Tse, who is leading our detention and bail fund work in advocacy for Cameron Advocacy Network. And of course, Josiane, who is the community promotora who is literally holding it um, um, down in San Diego. So um, we started from, as I mentioned, providing basic services. Now we are one of the major organizations that, um, that are leading um, in organizing policy and advocacy. So from one person to two, to now I believe we have a staff of 20, um, we have a legal department, we have a policy and advocacy department, we have a social uh, service department, and we are in the middle of, of really building a community center here in San Diego where all people will come and be able to get the, um, the support that they need. Um, so I will say from the 12, 10, 12 people that we have met, to winning TPS for over 200,000 Haitians, to winning TPS for over 40,000 Cameroonians, to leading into TPS for over uh, 40,000 uh, Ethiopians, to supporting TPS for over 300,000 Venezuelans, and to currently be pushing for uh, uh, relief for uh, Mauritania, Mali, uh, continued pushing for TPS for Honduras uh, in uh, Nicaragua, and our uh, brothers and sisters to our South and Central America. So it's, 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 it shows that we, not only were we called to serve, but we are serving and will continue to do so. Um, the impact we could never measure. Um, a lot of time people ask, so what's the data? There's no data. <laughs> Why Dr. Calderon? There's no data. If you need data, go talk to Dr. Calderon. <laughs> and I also want to acknowledge Dr. Calderon, our, our sister organization providing uh, critical medical support uh, for folks uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and, and really, that's the reality. We literally are starting, we have started from scratch, and we are undeterred 
to making sure that we, we force for the changes that are needed, that the same opportunities that I received, that all people should be able to have access with that. It will not be easy. We know that we understand it because we have lived it, but it is possible. Thank you. We've, we've seen, uh, I mean, things are constantly changing and uh, we've had Title 42 expansion uh, since January and now uh, supposedly, it's supposed to end on May 11th. If, if this happens with what's been announced today, for instance, and all the new measures, what are your predictions on what will happen with once Title 42 ends and, and these measures come into play? One thing that is constant, um, as you mentioned this past three, three administrations now, is that we can never know what will happen. Um, but what we are understanding is that once Title 42 is lifted, um, the administration will move to Title, title 8, and people will be quickly um, um, processed and most likely returned to their home countries and or Mexico for uh, specific countries such as um, uh, Haiti, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Cuba. They, they have an agreement with Mexico that those people can be sent back to Mexico. But we do understand that they have restarted deportation both to Haiti and Cuba. They had a deportation to Haiti yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, so, so we are keeping close eyes on, on what is going to happen, but we are extremely worried that the majority of those people, including uh, families, will be detained and possibly uh, deported. So as I said before, I think it is necessary that we really push the government, push the administration to address root causes of migration and making sure we are on the right side of history because we are not looking good. Even with the promise of, of uh, the parole program, for example, for um, Haiti, Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, and that is a program that we pushed really, really, really hard to make sure that um, people get protection. Because one thing, though, um, I, I, I failed to mention earlier is the anti-black racism that is embedded in our immigration uh, uh, system, in the policies that are being enacted. When we were receiving Ukrainians, which we applaud and we welcome, and we actually worked for, uh, for, for that, the reality is I have, could have been family members from my husband's side. Um, you know, coming from, from either Russia or Ukraine. But the difference is when we were receiving Ukrainians, the way we received them, we received them with dignity. And we were receiving uh, Ukrainians and we received about 29,000 Ukrainians within a month, but we at the same time were deporting Haitians. And one thing that really hurt me, hurt my heart, is one picture of President Biden going to Poland and holding this beautiful little girl, I believe she was 11 years old, telling her that, she, that he cares for her, that he sees her, that he will welcome her. But at the same time, he never stepped foot at the US-Mexico border to look at the little black girl little brown boys in search of safety and protection. So that really you know, hurt my, my heart. And what I say and what we say is that the same care and compassion that we are able to afford for the Ukrainians, well-deserved, should be the same measure for all people. With that in mind, can you speak a little bit about the experience of women uh, and girls, Haitian girls at the border? Is this experience gendered? Um, what I've had the privilege of sitting 
um, really, you know, at the feet of those people just to learn because I still don't understand it. I'm in Orange County, y'all. I am spoiled. <laughs> and I grew up in Orange County, Haiti, Orange County. So I would not survive the first 30 minutes. And that's my reality. And so in order for me to better advocate on behalf of all people, but specifically women and girls um, in displacement, in migration, to understand their stories. Um, many of the women have been raped on the way. The men as well, to the Darien, in Nicaragua, along the place, understanding as black people we cannot hide. Um, so they share stories of, of a lot of, of, of um, pain, a lot of disappointment, um, but they are strong. They are survivors. That's why we don't want them to survive anymore. We want them to thrive. But they, they have very painful stories, deep scars that they carry with them. I remember um, meeting a, a mother and her daughter, and I could not understand how the six-year-old little girl survived the journey. And the mother said, I made it because of her. She literally was the, the, the light, right? Because every time she would look at her, she knew she had to get up one more day. She knew she had to continue to push in the hope, in the hope that if they make it, she will have a better life. In her search for life, was it just for her? It was for her daughter and an entire village that they left behind. Because when people get to the United States, they have to provide for entire communities they live back home. So it's never just that person, it's all of those you will never see, all of those you will never know their names, but providing support for one person could be the meaning of life and death for hundreds of people. You spoke about the racialized violence on both border policies. How can we make these policies more equitable? Well, <laughs> how, much, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, you know, by, by advocating for better policies, by making sure that people understand that migration um, is a human right issue, migration is a... a um, racial justice issue by changing the narratives. Because when we turn on the TV and we hear invasion by Haitians at the US-Mexico border, what we do as a country, we send the military, right? Um, and I think when we hear narrative that they are criminals and rapists and all of that, um, how do we make sure we change our narratives and we push on, on, on the Congress, because at the end of the day, Congress must do their work and create a policies that are rooted, as I mentioned, um, in, in, in dignity instead of, of all the deterrence and negative connotation that comes with that. And it is our, our job to really use our voices for those who cannot speak for themselves. We pay our taxes, our vote, is our strength, um, our vote is, is, is um, I don't wanna use weapon, it's our tools, right? Um, to really make sure that uh, uh, people in Washington DC are listening to uh, the realities and pushing for policies that will center that. Um, black immigrants exist. Um, I was born black, I woke up black, I'm still black and I'm an immigrant. Uh, so centering that, centering that reality, right, for people to understand, and, and really, as we say in Haiti, is "apil me balu," which means many hands lighten the load. But one thing I heard um, um, in Africa, I just flew in from Cape Verde last night to be able to to be with you today. And um, I was on climate justice displacement, and I was speaking to a brother from the Ghana, 
and, and he shared, he said, if you think that you are too small to make a difference, start laying in bed with a mosquito. Because he said, as tiny as the mosquito is, it will not let you sleep, right? It will bite you, it will go around, and you will try to chase it all over the place. But that tiny little mosquito can really move things along. So I think if you think you don't, you, you're too small or just one person cannot make a difference, Think of yourself as using whatever power you have. It could be your voice, it could be your vote, it could be all of those different things putting together to support communities in need and center the fact that um, migration, immigration, immigrants have, have many faces. And what I always say is if we, as the United States, we fall into very few categories, right? You either, an indigenous person upon whose land we occupy, we still occupy. You are a descendant of immigrants, somebody who have left whatever country to come here three, 400 years ago. Um, or you were brought here by force, um, enslaved here. So each one of us here fall into one of those categories, right? Whether your parents, when parents came from the Mayflower, or somebody who's still at the US-Mexico border knocking, the reality is it could be you. Not only could it be you, it is you. Um, what do you see as the main issues in the way services are being managed in the refugee I said these sectors today, what do you think needs to change immediately? Um, I, I think there's not enough funding, um, or, or, you know, uh, across board. Um, we have amazing organizations such as RRC, resettlement agencies. We also have small um, grassroots organizations that are struggling to provide support. I think that it is critical, it is imperative that when we are looking into way to support, that we, we really uh, focus and center those, or, those community organizations that are literally on the ground within the community, such as HRA is providing the, the, the health uh, support, and um, Sidewalk School in Reynosa, you know, the only um, uh, Afro-Mexican woman in, in, in Reynosa and Mataboros supporting with nothing, right? So I believe that it, we should look into how um, we make sure that the larger resettlement agencies have the right fund that they need to be able to provide the critical services that they provide, but at the same time make sure that grassroots organizations uh, are not making sacrifices and dying in order for them to serve the communities. You spoke about the US addressing the root causes of migration. What would that look like? Pardon me? You spoke about the US addressing the root causes of migration. What would that look like? Uh, that is very important. And I, I, from what I understand, it is one of, uh, it is a priority for the administration. Um, and um, they, they have started to look uh, um, into root causes of migration, but unfortunately we see that comes with a lot of deterrent policies. Um, currently there is an agreement with um, uh, Colombia and Panama in the United States, and, and that is not rooted in trying to find protection for the people but rather how do we make sure that they don't make it to the next step. Um, there is also the agreement with Canada that we know a lot of folks, if they cannot survive in the US, they might make their way to Canada, which now may not be a possibility. Um, we, we are currently understanding that there's, there's some agreement between um, uh, Guatemala, Mexico, um, I, I, I can't remember which other countries as of today, as of this morning, 
Uh, but the, the issue is, even when those policies can have a sliver of, of the rainbow, it's the carrot is a baby carrot and the stick is an entire forest. Um, so really, really looking into, into those very specific and understand those um, and see how we can push uh, to make the necessary changes. Because as, as we all know, um, people in mobility uh, need, need, need all the help that, that they can get. And again, migration is a human right. We always say that the immigration system is broken, as we're saying, but what does an unbroken immigration system look like? What does, it look like? What does an unbroken immigration system look like? Uh, un <sighs> I, I, I mean, it could look like um, centering the little girl in Mexico the same way we centered the little girl in Ukraine. Um, it, it should mean providing access to um, providing access to safety. Uh, it could mean centering our, our policies. Uh, we move or taking our policies away from deterrence by addressing, as we mentioned before, with causes of migration. I know we are running out of time, but let me quickly mention: in the case of Haiti, right? I, myself, dream of a day where we have zero Haitians at the border. That is my dream. But as two weeks ago, my cousins got killed, I know they might have to flee. And they might end up at the border. That is my reality. So addressing what causes of migration means looking into what's happening on the ground, providing safety providing infrastructure, helping them rebuild with the school, the healthcare, uh, decentralization of the, the capital, then, only then, we can see a decrease of numbers of people. Because right now, the administration is, is patting themselves on the back saying the numbers have decreased. Just because people are dying elsewhere doesn't mean the numbers are dec decreasing. It simply means, um, come on, uh, how you say, um, out of sight, out of out of sight, out of mind. But um, really, how do we center the fact that we can provide legal and regular pathway for people to seek safety, to seek asylum, um, without having to risk their lives? Um, that, that's what I would like to see. My dream is to have zero people at the U.S.-Mexico border. My dream is for LGBTQI plus Jamaican men to be able to live in Jamaica without being burned by acid. My dream is for people in Uganda to be able to live free. My dream is my Mexican, my Guatemalan, my Undo people from all over the world be able to choose to stay or choose to leave, but not being forced to stay, remain, and die on the way or at the border. Okay. Lastly, to close up, you've said before that the Haitian proverb, uh, with more hands, the work is lighter, is the, the vision and the inspiration behind Haitian Bridge Alliance. How can the people in this room lend a hand to lighten that workload? Well, the call is for you to please join us in this journey. The journey is painful, um, it's difficult, but I guarantee you, it is worth it. Every time you touch a life, um, every time Charlotte goes to court and then she puts a text and said, we were able to get so and so released today. Um, or as uh, Daniel is entering into, um, into the room, send me a text and said, Felix has been released, people who've been in detention for seven months. Um, so we invite you to join us in this journey of love, of freedom, of compassion, 
And um, if you're an attorney, we are looking for your help. You're, you're a doctor, we are looking for that. You're a teacher, you are, we are looking for that. Again, see yourself as the mosquito and uh, reach out to us. Join us in this journey, uh, info at haitianbridge.org, info at haitianbridge.org. Um, many hands lighten the load. Thank you so much. One more round of applause, everyone. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, fantastic, fantastic Q&A. Um, to close our evening tonight and to close uh, the film festival overall, I would like to invite up to the stage not only someone who's been the driving force behind bringing the film festival here, but also a driving force in pushing the University of San Diego to live up to its expressed values and, and make the border region more peaceful, just, and inclusive. So please uh, help me in welcoming to the stage Farah Karapedian. Thanks, Andy. Um, and thank you, Gerlin. That was, that was really a powerful call to action. Um, I'm Farah Karapedian. I'm a professor of art, actually, in the College of Arts and Sciences here. Um, and I was thinking as you were speaking, you mentioned um, Frederick Douglass, and uh, he's actually the first um, reading we do in my intro photo classes because he was the first person to kind of... Um, I would say right, but he, he spoke it, um, a philosophy of photography. And it was right during the Civil War. He, um, it was in the context, of course, of abolition. And he, um, he recognized that photography gave to people, um, to the humblest servant girl, he put it, um, the right to self-represent, um, the power to actually see the way they're seen by others and to control that. Um, and I, 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 th I thought of that uh, when you were speaking. I thought of that also when we were putting together this film festival, when I first asked uh, Maria Silva at the IRC if we could host the, the film festival here at the Humanities Center over in the college, uh, which evolved into this wonderful context over here at the Croc. Um, I imagined centering the voices of refugees as experts in their own circumstance. And I, I think that we've succeeded in, in in, in many respects. Um, our first evening, if you were here with us that night, we watched Christopher Chambers' A Fire Within, and we heard him speak to the ways in which he kind of really, truly co-created that film uh, with the strong Ethiopian women who had dramatically brought the men uh, who tortured them to justice. We also heard that night from Charlotte Johnson uh, here at the university about her work organizing the housing of refugees at USD for now the third year in a row. So 15 people will live here this summer and work with the IRC from the comfort of our dorms uh, to stabilize their futures. Um, the second evening, we followed the vignettes of distinct Syrian experiences. And this is one of the ways I think that we can work against those narratives of hostility and, and victimhood um, that so pervade our television screens. Megan Mylan made simple as water. We, we saw that last week. She didn't try to diverse, um, she didn't try to reduce a diverse experience to one narrative. Um, and what we got the, from that film and the film before were some of the successes and challenges of the kind of monumentally bureaucratic pathways um, individual, individuals take while circumnavigating the globe, as well as some of their impetus, you know, which we all share, looking to protect our families from harm, looking to keep growing and living, and willing to take on the unknown when our circumstances compromise that growth, that life, that instinct to protect. 
So here we are in night three, Finding Life Indeed, and I want to thank Topher McDougall for collaborating with me for, uh, to bring this series to the Joan B. Kroc School of Peace Studies, uh, Andy Bloom, uh, for deepening our engagement with tonight's speakers' insights, Maria Silva at the IRC for our partnership, the Otto family for their support of the festival, and Sharon Kennedy for starting it 15 years ago. Clay Alexander, who spoke earlier at the IRC for his tireless coordination of this festival, and uh, Kate Davila, Lindy Villa, Ashley Boren, and Galileo up in the booth. Galileo up in the booth is kind of an amazing thing. <laughs> hadn't occurred to me until just then. Um, <laughs> for all their work on production, and also all of the student volunteers, um, my dean, Noel, Brian, um, and President Harris himself, who spoke eloquently on our night, our second night, and without whose blessing we would not be housing people here so in need. Most of all, I want to thank the IRC um, as an institution for the work it does in communities all over the world uh, to keep lives moving forward in peace. So thank you all for coming and for your support of IRC and asylum seekers. Next year's Humanity Center programs will move from borders to borderlessness as we center our indigenous partners. And I'm really happy to have been able to do this here um, and to bring together all of these institutions um, because you know what else is a school but a forum for thinking about the ways forward for us all. And what else should it be but a place to actually find and practice and encourage the work of peace. Good night. <laughs>